Often, uh, people who haven't really read the Bible will say things like, I like Jesus, I like this Jesus fella, um, but I'm not really into all that Old Testament stuff. I'm kind of a New Testament kind of person. People haven't really read the Bible get this sort of idea that the Old Testament God is this angry, vengeful, judgmental God who just can't wait for people to mess up so he can, kind of, can just kind of smite them. But, uh, you know, thank goodness Jesus came along and, uh, you know, did a bit of PR for his dad, smoothed out his public image, and um, because, of course, you know, Jesus is the patient God. He is the God who loves children and feeds people and heals people and just loves people. He's also the God who says in verse 41, O oh, faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? This isn't, you know, gentle Jesus, meek and mild, is it? This is frustrated Jesus, strong and wild. What do we do with this? What do we do with this story? A father comes along asking for some help, and Jesus replies with frustration. How long do I have to be with you all? How long do I have to be with this kind of humanity? How long do I have to bear with your nonsense? How are we supposed to feel about this, uh, this part of the Gospels? Is this a reason that, oh, do you know what? Mm, maybe this is a reason to have questions about Jesus of Nazareth. Is this, is this a reason to doubt him? To call his character into question? Is Jesus angry at me like this? Do I make Jesus feel this way? Isn't it bad news for Jesus to feel this way? Well, let's answer some of those questions as we look at the text. Let's start by putting all this in place. So Jesus has just been up the mountain with three of his disciples, with Peter and James and John. And while they're up there, while they're up there, down on the ground, so to speak, at the bottom of the mountain, a man brings his son to be healed. And the disciples who were left behind uh, can't do it. It's not that they didn't try. It's not even that they shouldn't have tried. It's that they just couldn't do it. It was perfectly appropriate that they should try. Jesus has made them apostles now. He's, he's sent them. He's given them special, uh, he's given them spiritual gifts that he's ordained them, uh, allowed them to use. But this time, it isn't working. And so we get this contrast, don't we, uh, between the top of the mountain and the bottom. A contrast between this glory in the heights of heaven and the grip of the devil upon the inhabitants of the earth. And so what we're looking forward to is Jesus coming down the mountain and setting everything right. But what does that look like? What does it look like as Jesus comes down the mountain and sets everything right? You see, as we read through Luke's Gospel, if we kind of just read through it, you know, without stopping, we come to the Transfiguration and well, this is different. This is special. This is clearly a very important event, a high point of the gospel. It feels significant. And as we read it, we get the impression like everything's going to change now. Everything's going to change. I mean, Jesus' appearance has, has actually changed on the mountain. And then we get this kind of almost passing of the torch, this change uh, as um, things are handed on from Elijah, from the law and the prophets to Jesus. So, you know, we get this picture, don't we? Elijah and Moses are there. They represent the law and the prophets. And the cloud comes down. And the Father says, right, listen to Jesus. And the cloud lifts and the law and the prophets are gone. And Jesus is there. He's the only revelation you need. In this epic moment that is full of indicators of change, we're thinking, right, this is it. It's going to happen. But instead, Jesus comes down the mountain, and if, any, if anything has changed, it's only for the worse. Jesus comes down the mountain, and he's greeted with conflict and faithlessness. Now, a word on this. Because 
there are a few legitimate ways of reading the Gospels um, and understanding them. We, we thought a bit about this in our very first sermon in Luke quite a while ago. Because the Gospels are unique in all the Bible, aren't they? They are the only place where we have the same events recorded and covered by four different human authors. And so it's important we ask the question, why are there four Gospels? Why not just one Gospel? Why did the Spirit cause Matthew to write differently to Mark? Why did he get Luke to include different things to John? Was it, was it too difficult for the Holy Spirit to fit it all into, into one book? Or could he just not, you know, could he not quite get them to write exactly what he wanted? So he had to have a do-over until he got it right. Of course not. Like we laugh because it's, it's, it's ridiculous to think that, isn't it? Those are ridiculous ideas. And the reason we laugh at that is because the living God has recorded the Bible exactly the way he wants it to be recorded. And so we go forward with that in mind. Whenever we come up with questions of conflicts between the, what we see as conflicts between the Gospels, well, like, hang on a minute, God didn't make a mistake. What's going on? So it's perfectly legitimate to what we call harmonize the Gospels um, and line them up at times. It's legitimate to do that at times. To bring details from one gospel and line them up with the details of another gospel. Uh, to understand the big picture of what's gone on in Jesus' life and ministry. To, to shed light on it. But we also, we must consider the gospels by themselves. And let each of them say what they say by themselves. What the Spirit would have that gospel writer say. Without, always, without flattening out the accounts and removing the bumps along the roads. Because there are times when um, one of the Gospels may record something which is slightly confusing to us. And we might be tempted to explain it away with a detail from the other Gospel. Go, well, I don't know what this Gospel writer is on about, so I'll take what this one says about that event. And we'll just go with this one. We're basically saying that bit's wrong at that point, aren't we? That's a problem. And the danger is we flatten out the two accounts and we flatten out what seem to us to be conflicting truths as we miss the point that Jesus is trying to make for us. In other words, what I'm saying is we need to be careful not to second guess the living God uh, and, and, and edit him um, or think we know better than him. Now the thing is, and the reason I say this is because we actually naturally, I think, prefer the idea of harmonisation. Um, harmonization sits more comfortably with our modern view of the world where we understand like things only happen in one way there is one timeline there are people are only ever one thing at any one time there is a single accurate timeline of events and that is where we find the truth but the bible writers didn't write this way they never have from genesis to revelation they don't see the world this way. And so we need to not read the, word, the Bible this way. As I said, there are times where it's appropriate to line things up if it helps us to see Jesus and to understand. But we must be careful not to fall into the trap of believing that only a chronological account can contain truth. Luke isn't making a mistake when he record something differently to another writer. And Jesus has recorded both versions, if we can call it that, for a reason. They both tell us something true. The reason I say all this now is because we've got one of those right here, I think. Got one of those situations. In Matthew's Gospel, it's very clear that it's the disciples' faith that Jesus is calling into question. So when he says this, oh, faith this generation is... It's very much directed at the disciples in Matthew's Gospel. In Mark, no one's particularly singled out, but the Father is portrayed as having, or at least wanting, faith. Here in Luke, however, it seems as though it is the whole group that is rebuked, and if anything, the Father is portrayed as lacking faith. His request isn't just to help my son, it's, a complaint against the apostles. It's a complaint against God's sent ones. They didn't do it. You didn't do it right, Jesus, when you gave them what you gave them. 
It seems to be more than just a simple, humble request for help. It's a complaint. That's certainly, you know, just how Cyril of Alexandria and some of the other church fathers see this section. So, just bear this in mind as you read the Gospels. Let each of them say what they say and resist the modern urge to understand them as a series of chronological events. The Bible isn't a book of facts. It's a book of truth. It tells us about Jesus. And so we must ask what truth, what reality is being revealed to us here in Luke's account, in Luke's gospel. Okay? So Jesus comes down the mountain after speaking with Moses and Elijah. He's, he's just heard his father's voice. How, I don't, we don't know how long it's been since he's heard his father's voice. It's really special. And he comes down the mountain and he's like, oh, yes. And he comes down. And as he descends, he's just bombarded by people, complaints, and then, I don't know, and then Jesus is a bit mean. It's kind of how we read it, don't we? It's what it feels like a little bit, like we're not, we're not really used to this. Jesus seems a bit annoyed. He seems a bit frustrated, and we can, we can, we can really understand why, can't we? I wonder how we feel about this. I mean, this, you might say, well, this dad was just asking for some help. And yet Jesus seems frustrated with him and with everyone. What's going on? Well, this clearly isn't, you know, the whitewashed, feminized, pansy Jesus that we're often given in, in the media. This isn't, you know, let's all just have a big hug fest and sing come by our and love everyone. No. Jesus has got business to do, hasn't he? he? There's a surgery that needs to be done and carried out on humanity. And it's going to be painful. And Jesus is here to get it done. And this lot are just distracted. And so he says, oh faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you and bear with you? The thing is, we might think this sounds strange, but this is actually the way Jesus has always spoken to his people, isn't it? Um, we've heard him speak this way before. In fact, we've heard him use these very words before in Deuteronomy. This is how he speaks quite often to Israel during the Exodus. And so what we see is humanity hasn't changed and God hasn't changed. We're seeing a repeat here. We're rewinding the tape. I think we see a strong parallel here to what happens when Moses goes up the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments. Because what happens when he comes down? So he goes up, he has this tremendous experience on the mountain. And when he comes down, we read it this morning, he finds they've made a golden calf. And they're worshipping him. They've forgotten, well, they, they've forgotten about Jesus. Moses goes up the mountain, he speaks with Jesus, he receives the law, he receives the plan for the tabernacle, this model of the universe and all reality. And Moses is up the mountain and this is it! You know, God called us out of Egypt. He said, I will bring you to the worship on this mountain. Well, we've made it to this mountain. I am stood with Jesus on the mountain. I, I've, I've been given the law. I've been given this pattern for this home where God is going to live forever. My, my face is shining. Surely this is it. This is the turning point. It's all up from here. Uh, no. No. Moses comes down the mountain to conflict and complaints and rampant faithlessness he's been away for a little while they don't know what to do without him they lose sight when they lose sight of Moses they lose sight of faith and the same has happened here hasn't it the same has happened here and Jesus reacts in much the same way in Exodus as he does here we read it I have seen this people and behold they are stiff necked people now therefore let me alone that my wrath may burn hot against them and I may consume them. This is the thing. Of course there's no difference between the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament. For he is the same God. He hasn't changed. I think that's pretty amazing. I think it's really comforting. The one true God has always been the triune God. Father, Son and Holy Spirit. And this triune God has been made known to us in the person of Jesus. And only and always ever in the person of Jesus. So when Adam and Eve were walking in the garden... They're walking with Jesus. When God wrestles with Jacob, who becomes Israel, that's Jesus. 
When God speaks to Moses from a burning bush, that's Jesus. When Moses speaks with God in the tent, when he speaks with him up the mountain, that's Jesus. He is the one who makes the Father known. He is the intermediary between God and man, always. And so when we hear Jesus speak in this way, it shouldn't be jarring, because we've heard him speak this way before. It's serious. Jesus is serious. He's getting to the heart of the matter, just as he did on Sinai. And do you know what? People can decide to get all hung up uh, about how they perceive Jesus' tone to be here. And people can dare to judge the living God. But I would seriously warn against doing that. The moment we think that we are more compassionate, more kind, more patient than Jesus, then boy, we've stepped in some dangerous territory. We can be tempted to, you know, get our, our pants all in a knot about Jesus' tone. But what does he do? He heals and restores even those who, he ang who, who angers him. This is good news. I think Jesus is frustrated here. I, I don't even say Jesus is annoyed here. And I don't, I don't have a problem with saying that. It's not sinful to be frustrated. It can, be it can be sinful to be frustrated at the wrong things. To be, for, yeah, well, we won't have to list them. That could be sinful. We can act in sinful ways out of frustration. But of course, that's not what Jesus is doing. So why is Jesus frustrated? Well, let's just think about it for a moment. Jesus has been talking to Moses and Elijah and they get it. What well, have been talking about? His, his exodus, his cross. The reality of the world, they see it clearly. And then he comes down to a group of people who are so focused, not on the cross, but on this world. What is Jesus' frustration? It's a frustration with sin. It's a frustration with sin. His frustration is with the unbelief that surrounds him. The hard-heartedness of the people. Their inability to listen and learn and see what this world is really all about. Even though he's been telling them for hundreds of years through the prophets like Elijah. And yet, all they seem to want from him is these temporal, physical things. So Jesus is frustrated. I wonder how that sits with us, saying that Jesus is frustrated. Remember what we said last week about reading the Bible. If we start with the text rather than the person of Jesus. Well, actually, we don't, we don't even just start with the text. We start with ourselves. And what happens is, we, if we just begin with this, and we analyse it by looking down on it, by placing ourselves above it as the judge of this text, if we believe that we hold the key to unlocking this text, and that... It has to satisfy our ideas and our curiosity. Then we will begin to come up with all sorts of wrong ideas about Jesus. And, and putting the person of Jesus aside. You know, well, let's find, we come to the text. And we might begin to say things like, well, Jesus had a short temper. Jesus didn't really have control of his passions. Well, Jesus only spoke like that because he was tired. Do you know what? Jesus sinned just like us. And people say those sorts of things because they think they know better. They think that their understanding of the text is what matters. People come to all sorts of wrong and heretical ideas about Jesus when we start by assuming that humans can understand the Bible just with our human minds without starting with Jesus and asking for his help and reading it with him in mind. But when we start with Jesus, not as an idea, not as a chapter in a textbook, not as a philosophy, but as a person who has made himself known, as a person, and when we start with him as the person he has shown himself to be in our lives and in the history of the world, 
When we start with saying that he is the glorious son of heaven, the only perfect human, the God-man, who hasn't wiped humanity off the face of the earth, even though he could have done, who hasn't said, I'm done with you, even though he should have done, when we begin by seeing him as the God who stepped down into our mess and joined us, who took our flesh and our sin and died in our place without ever asking for a single thing in return, when we start with him, the very idea of him being selfish or bad-tempered or unloving or sinful are all seen to be the stupid human ideas that they are. And yet they are human ideas that we are sometimes tempted to believe. As we read the Bible and we come against this holy God who has some really hard things to say about our sin and our life and what we do. Well, he's just being unreasonable. I don't like what he says. We need to start always with Jesus. We will never understand anything of God. We will never understand anything of this book unless we start with Jesus. Jesus is the good God who is annoyed at sin and who is frustrated with fallen humanity, with what we believe and how we've allowed ourselves to be carried away by the devil. He's frustrated and sad that sin has cut the people off from resting in him. And has stopped them from enjoying the life of heaven that he just wants to share with us. And so Jesus is like, do you know what? I can't wait to get to the cross. That's what I'm, I'm laser focused there. That's all he wants to do. He wants to see this distracted humanity killed. Even though it means it being killed in him first. And the reason he wants to do that is because he so wants to see it killed in you. He wants to see you free of it. He is frustrated because his people, people made to live with him and enjoy him, seem to be obsessed with everything but him and his good life. Things we, we actually know what that's like, don't we, as Christians? Um, hopefully you have some experience of this frustration, though not as perfectly as he does. But Monday morning will inevitably feel a bit like this. After the high point of your week, the divine worship on Sunday, as you've been surrounded by your church family who love you even though you're a screw-up, who just want to talk to you about Jesus, who are obsessed with him and his life. On Monday morning, you, you go back to work. You go back to school, wherever it may be. And people don't want to talk about Jesus. And it's weird. Why don't they want to talk about Jesus? They want to talk about money. Or some, like, you know, awful gossipy reality TV program that they've been watching the weekend. Or they just want to, they just want to, like, moan. And, and we understand it, don't we? And share with you how hard and sad their life is. We want to share some struggle that they're having that they can't get help with. And, and so you invite them to church. You invite them to come and meet Jesus. The only person who's been able to make sense of your life. But they're not interested. In fact, they look at you a bit funny for even suggesting that church could help them. And so you feel frustrated. Because you know that Jesus is the only one who can help them. And give them purpose and give them real life. You know that there's a far better life to be had than the one that is offered up for gossip and fantasy. And that there is a life far more pure and noble worth talking about than the ones portrayed on the telly. We know that there is a life far richer, even in the depths of poverty. Far richer than the life of money can buy. And so as his people, we have experienced something of what it must have felt like for Jesus here. And yet, also different. Because the thing that should really make us sad, the thing that should really frustrate us, is not when we see all those attitudes in other people, when we see them in ourselves. 
when we see them in ourselves, when we find ourselves getting caught up with gossip at work. Boys and girls, we were thinking about this the other week, weren't we? How, how dangerous that is. When we find ourselves beginning to believe that our paycheck will make us happy. When we begin to believe that the world and my place and my status and my comfort is all that really matters. I hope that you have all had that experience of being utterly frustrated and annoyed with yourself, with your flesh, with your desires, and kind of saying, like, What are you doing, duck? How you said that to yourself? What are you doing? Why are you like this all the time? I don't even want to be like this. Yeah, I do. We do it. Do you feel that? I hope you do. Oh, it's not just me. You should feel that way. You should feel frustrated and angry at your own sin. And you should feel sad and frustrated in love for the lostness of others. And so if we, as sinful human beings, messed up creatures, if we can be frustrated by sin in ourselves and in others in a somewhat holy and righteous way, how much more must Jesus, the perfect Son of Heaven, be able to be frustrated at sin in a perfectly holy way? You see, we have a God who can get annoyed and frustrated and angry. And actually, this is really good news. Now, people might think that they want a chilled out God, you know, who, who never calls them out on their nonsense, who just lets things slide and just wants to be friends with everyone all the time, who wants to be liked. So people can say things to me like, well, your God said this. How do you explain that away? I'm like, I don't feel like I need to. I understand you don't like that, but that's what he said. He doesn't need you to like him. He wants to give you his life. We've just come from the transfiguration, and we might think, like you know, Peter, um, that we just we want bright, shiny Jesus. We want nice, neat Jesus, who doesn't display real emotions. But let me tell you, I'm thrilled that we have a serious Jesus. A Jesus who feels these hard and heavy emotions and who deals with them accordingly. Because Jesus' majesty is not mainly seen in the shining mountaintop experience. But his majesty is seen chiefly in showing mercy to sinners. And so I want to use this term very carefully, trusting that you will listen carefully and hear what I mean. But I don't want shiny Jesus. I want dark Jesus. Now, obviously Jesus is the light of the world. There's no darkness in him. But I want the Jesus who comes down into the darkness. I want the Jesus, no, no, I need the Jesus who gets down in the muck and wrestles with my filth. I need the Jesus who plunges himself down into the darkness, who embraces the darkness, not in an accepting hug, but in a death choke. I, want, I need the Jesus who comes down and beats the snot out of the devil. Who deals with my dirt and the shame of my sin. If bright, shiny, transfiguration Jesus had stayed bright and shiny, there's no hope for me. And there's no hope for you. I want gritty Jesus who comes to the coal face of my sin and gets his hands dirty. Because that's the only Jesus that can save me. I... I want him to be annoyed. I want him to be annoyed with me. I'm annoyed with me. I'm annoyed with my behavior and my thoughts and my words. You better believe I hope that Jesus is a good enough God that, and a righteous enough God that he's also annoyed and frustrated at my sin and my behavior. I want a Jesus who is angry and frustrated with my sin because that's the only kind of Jesus who will actually deal with it. He won't just brush it under the carpet and pretend it didn't happen. But he'll deal with it for me. Because I can't. I want a Jesus who's frustrated and angry enough with sin that he will go even to the cross for it, for me. To free me and to free you too. And that is exactly what he did do. Verse 43, but while they were all marvelling at everything he was doing, Jesus said to his disciples, let these words sink, I love that, sink deep into your ears. The Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men. 
While everyone's celebrating and having a party, what's just happened? He pulls the disciples aside and he's like, don't, don't get caught up in this. This is not what it's about. You need to get this. This isn't happy clappy time. This is go time. This is gritty and real time. And I think that's a really good, as you say, on a day to day basis, you are going to feel often that your life is gritty and real. That you are down in the muck, whether it be wrestling with children, or wrestling with work, or wrestling with the, the desires of your own heart and your sin. And you might be tempted to think, ah, oh, there's no place, like Jesus isn't here. Jesus can't be in this. This is too messy. No, no, no. That's exactly where he is. It's exactly where he wants to be. Exactly where he loves to be with you in your mess. Don't go thinking, I can't pray just yet. I've just, I've like, I've said something horrible. I've looked at something horrible. I've done something horrible. I need to give like this cooling off period before I come to God. Because I'm just too mucky right now. No, 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 no. That's exactly when you come straight to him. Because you aren't getting that muck off you by yourself. You come to him and he's like, hugs you, wipes it all off you as your mind. In the midst of your dark moments in your day, when everything's crowding in, when you've lost your temper for whatever it is time, when you, he's there and you immediately need to call out to him for help. That's, that's where you need to call out to him for help. He says, don't get caught up with all this celebrating that's going on here. He says it's time for the gritty and the real. Because Jesus doesn't think that what's just happened it actually is a very big deal. It's not that he doesn't care for the father or the child. He clearly does. Else he wouldn't have helped them. And if he didn't care for them, he wouldn't have been frustrated about their sin. I don't know, kids, you're in here and this is good for you to hear as well. As parents, we sometimes feel very frustrated at your sin. It's because we love you. And we get angry at your sin. And we're not per- we don't get perfectly angry like Jesus does. But because we love you, we hate to see the ways you behave sometimes. Just as we hate to see the way we behave. That's why we discipline you. Because we love you. But Jesus cares about something far greater here than just this boy being healed and set free. Because this situation is different from Jairus' daughter. This is different from the woman with the discharge of blood. And we see that very clearly in, in the text. You see, the boy here, do you remember what we said about the Jairus's, about the woman with the bleeding and Jairus' uh, daughter? They were sozoed. They were saved. He isn't sozoed. He is just healed. Do you remember we saw that? He isn't saved. That's not the language here. He is simply healed. Jairus and, his, Jairus and the woman, they came in faith, wanting Jesus first and foremost. And so Jesus forgives their sin, and he saves them, and as a sign of that, he heals them as well. Sadly, it seems this man only gets the sign, because that's all he wanted. And perhaps the saddest thing of all is he's happy with it. There, doesn't, there is no faith here, and that is so sad because actually they get what they want they get what they asked for it wasn't what they really needed but Jesus can't save those who don't want him so I imagine this scene with G- ending with Jesus walking away his head kind of hung in sadness and frustration all over his shoulder we see the jubilant crowd just rejoicing in the background and Jesus is sad because as amazing as that may have appeared, it is nothing. It is not the thing that, that we need. It's not the thing that will save us. Don't come to church thinking, all my problems are going to disappear. Like you've, been, you've done church on Monday morning enough times to know they're still there waiting for you when you leave this building, when you leave this gathering. Don't come to church thinking, Jesus will just heal me and make me wealthy and make everyone like me. It doesn't work that way. He does, however, promise that he is the answer to all your deepest problems. That he can fix you. That he can give you a new life. A life that makes sense of the world around you and that sets you in your right mind. And gives you real life and joy 
even in the middle of all your troubles and anxieties. How does he do that? Through the cross. See, on the cross, Jesus put your old, selfish life to death. He killed your sin. Boys and girls, this is really exciting. You don't need to sin anymore. We don't need to sin anymore. We will because we choose to. But Jesus freed us. He killed the old humanity, the old you. So you don't need to be enslaved to your, new, to your old passions. He died so you don't need to be anxious about your life. So you can just give yourself to him. You don't need to worry about tomorrow. He says that he has that. Uh, and he's like, let's just take this one day at a time. I'll carry all the heavy stuff. You just enjoy life with me. When we want him and follow him, not just the gifts he gives, our lives will be rich and healthy. Not wealth with money, but rich with contentment. Not rich by earning, but rich by giving. Not healthy by living well in this world, but by dying to this world. Not by being loved and embraced by the world, but by embracing the foolish scorn of the cross and dying to this world. And so let this sink in, Jesus says. You think this is amazing? That's nothing. I'm God, and I'm going to be crucified for you. That is amazing. Cling to that. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.